is Forbidden Planet. <clears throat> Uh, this movie was actually developed in, or released in 1956. It was the very first sci-fi movie that Hollywood put money behind. So this is the first big budget sci-fi movie. And though it has a bit of male chauvinism, as all movies in this era did, this is actually one of the least. I would rather watch this than like most movies that talk about women in derogatory terms. In fact, this woman is pretty well a, a feminist in this, it's great. So we do have a couple of stars. One of them is Leslie Nielsen, and I do in fact mean that Leslie Nielsen, and this is probably the only time he played a serious role. <clears throat> and we also have Babel guest starring. He's being played by Robbie the Robot, which you've probably seen in other things, um, if you're at all a fan of like the early sci-fi movies. And though there have been a couple of sci-fi movies that were earlier than this, this was just like the big Hollywood one. So we're gonna hop right into the story. Our good ship, Node and NPM, is taking us to Altair IV, where tech debt threatens the project. Okay. And the engineering architect has sent the best JavaScript frameworks, but there's only one programmer left on this project. First question is, why is there only one developer? Like, where, where did everybody else go? And the second one is, why don't I see my favorite JavaScript framework later on? And the answer is because this was like 2012 or 13. So our JavaScript frameworks, who in this case are Angular, React, and Ember, go meet Dr. PHP, our one survivor. <laughs> All right, except Dr. PHP is not real happy to see these JavaScript frameworks or anyone for that matter, and says he's not leaving his tech stack and to go away. But, you know, JavaScript is like, well, you know, I've got to talk to the architect, get new instructions, see if he really wants us to leave or force ourselves. So he's like, fine, fine, come for tea. Except, <clears throat> surprise, he has a daughter that nobody knew about and she's never seen a JavaScript framework. <laughs> All right, this daughter is me in this story. So I'm Jen Luker. I'm a senior software engineer at Gremlin who breaks things on purpose. It falls very, very well into Christie's talk earlier uh, because of the fact that we do, in fact, do chaos engineering as a service. If you want to know more about that, ask me later. Uh, this is not that story. This is much earlier. You can also find me on Twitter, my website. So our JavaScript frameworks see uh, this lovely lady. And they get rather excited about that because you have, you know, Ember saying, yay, one of us. And you've got Angular going, new blood. And then you have React. So Ember being most popular in this era, or most frequently used in the circles in which I ran, uh, very quickly introduced himself. And, you know, I, I played with it a little bit. I wasn't real thrilled because I'm, I'm an old school dev. Old school dev. Uh, so I wasn't quite jiving very well with Ember. For, a variety of reasons. So I was also looking at other frameworks. And though Angular basically plot, you know, plays the wingman in this story, he never really came onto my radar. Uh, so React is really the other one that I thought was really interesting. It was brand new, it was up and coming, people were really excited about it. It was very much like the dev community drank that Kool-Aid. And, and not the poison Kool-Aid, more like the guy jumps out of the wall Kool-Aid. Um, they were just really, really excited about it, except, you know, you know how it is when you're on the bleeding edge, right? The bleeding edge means you're the one that's bleeding. So, you know, sometimes you just don't want to go for the new hotness. People love it, but are, is it really ready for production? All right, now, so while this was all happening to me, back in the front end community, we had you know, new texts like Webpack and Babel coming out that were allowing devs to try out new JavaScript features. And the thing with these is that you ended up with a lot 
of new libraries. And not only a lot of new JavaScript libraries and tools and features and frameworks, you also had a lot of new conferences hitting the scene too. And all of them had new ideas and new tools and new frameworks and, and new ways of doing things that they were trying to introduce. So back to me, I decided to really dive into Ember. It wasn't really my favorite. I'm not really a framework kind of girl. I was very much the, well, JavaScript is for the limited amounts of interactions you have to do. Everything else is supposed to be HTML or PHP because that's how the web works. And so I tried it out and it just still wasn't clicking. It was very hard to get this functioning. And in our story, React still shows up again. And this time, he's not too thrilled to see Ember here. But the problem was not Ember, the problem was me. The thing is, as I said before, JavaScript was really supposed to be like small interactions. It wasn't meant to be a language in my head. It was something that I'd never really dedicated any time towards. So how JavaScript worked was not very clear to me. And every framework has its pros and cons. I have no qualms about which one you choose. But in this case, I really was starting to get angry at React because it was a mind shift. The whole concept of state-based architecture was very, very new. Everything was still linear and if else's and for each's and function after function after function. So the, trying to wrap my head around state-based architecture on top of trying to really learn JavaScript was really hard for me. And I'd been a dev for a very long time, so I thought this should be easy. And you know, frameworks come and frameworks go. These will go eventually. It's not really important that I learn them right. Except I was determined. I really wanted to learn this. So I started playing with it and I started developing things. And I mean, I even went so far as to create a code pen where I wrote SVG line by line, parameter by parameter, as opposed to just drawing it and importing it so that I could understand SVGs better to see why I couldn't get SVGs to work in my React programs. Which did me absolutely no good because I didn't use React, but it was interesting nonetheless. But in our story, our communication array breaks. And by our, I mean the ship's communication array breaks. Which means we contact our engineering architect to determine whether we should switch off of the framework that we're on or the, the stack that we're on, which for me was the WIMP stack, over to more of a mean stack. And the real big problem here is that I thought the word no was much further than what I did know. And the deeper that I felt I got, the further away that goalpost went. And I went from being a very, very, very good PHP dev to being a really awful JavaScript dev. And you know, when you're picking up a new technology, a new language, that's expected. But I didn't allow myself to have those conversations. I shut myself off and started just trying to figure everything out on my own because I was embarrassed that I didn't feel like I was catching on as quickly as I needed to. You know, and this is the really first sign of this monster that we get to see. I started working longer and later. I was definitely more irritable. I really didn't want to hear about new crazy things that people were bringing onto the scene or into my stack. I stopped asking for help because I was embarrassed about how much I didn't know. And I really felt isolated because I wasn't entirely sure what everyone was talking about and everyone sounded so knowledgeable. And it wasn't until later that I figured out that most people kind of fake it for a while until they actually get it. And then the insomnia and the nightmares started. And I would dream where I would have, I would write something in code, and then I would run that code and it would be my dream. And if it ended badly, usually with a death or blood or murder or something, then I'd go back to the code and tweak it and modify it and rerun the code or the dream. 
And I'd go through and have this nightmare after nightmare after nightmare, trying to solve a code problem I was dealing with at work. And just when I started to think, okay, I'm starting to get a hold of JavaScript. I discover CSS and JS, which as a very, very, very old school dev, and we're talking, I started coding when I was nine on like basic on my Commodore 64 and I followed it all the way through. I was there when CSS was like brand spanking new and released. I was part of the web. So it, it threw me for a loop. And it took me a while to really get a hold of what CSS and JS was. And then once I got a hold of CSS and JS, it was trying to figure out how to make it work within this new paradigm of JavaScript. How would I use it? Do I have to learn a whole new library? Do I have to try to mash my old programs into this new framework? Do I have to spend nights and weekends doing this to convert it over? Do I have to do it by myself because I'm afraid to ask for help? You know, and the reason why React finally started clicking for me is because it allowed me the flexibility to learn as I went. I could use as much vanilla JavaScript or jQuery or whatever I needed at the time and then use React bits and pieces at a time and as I learned new things, I could adapt it and bring it in. Same thing with my CSS. I didn't have to start with a full-blown, fully fleshed CSS and JS library. It really captured my heart. And I think it's something that maybe Ember and Angular wouldn't have done at this period of my life because of the fact that I was having so many struggles with the basics of JavaScript in the first place. I was so used to the way the PHP functioned. So the ability to slowly adapt and not have to feel like I needed to memorize an entire framework before I could get started is what really ended up being my gateway drug into JavaScript. So back into our story, we're finally going to talk to Dr. PHP. And they go to his office, they break into his office essentially and start looking around and Dr. PHP walks through this secret wall and everyone's basically like, you know, what just happened? Trying to figure out where we end. No oh, good. So he walks us through to this very cool room part of this program. So this big building is essentially our program. It's our program Altair 4. And he walks us in and says, this is our brain booster machine. Essentially, the, the developers that were here before, they used this so that they could understand all this crazy spaghetti code. It was big and huge and powerful and complex, and it just took a special mind to be able to get it. All right, but the problem with comparing intelligence like that is this is where we think our heroes are. The people that we look up to, the people that came before us, or the people we see on Twitter, or maybe the principals or the architects in our own companies. And this is where we think we are. And this is where we think we should be. Maybe not quite as smart as them, but closer by a lot. You know, but this is where we actually are. And the difference is very much a Venn diagram in that the where we overlap in our knowledge may not be nearly as large as you think it should be. For instance, I know how to take apart a 3D printer and put it back together, but that doesn't necessarily do a whole lot of good for my front end development's job. And therefore, I know more than some of you about that. But you know more about Angular because Angular and I still have words. The difference is, is that we know different things. We've all had different experiences. That doesn't mean that we are mentally different. It just means that our lives have led us to this place where the level of knowledge that we have on certain subjects is different. So after the grand tour of this ridiculously giant program. It turns out that the original creators have vanished from tech. We don't know where they went, they're just gone. 
And in the meantime, back at our ship, we actually get to see imposter syndrome for the first time. We actually identify it. And by the time I identified it, it was almost too late because my self-esteem was gone. I'd isolated myself from everyone, and not just my coworkers, not just my boss, but my spouse, my friends. And I'd found excuses not to go to work, even a mention of a headache, and I was out. Oh, some small thing happened, or oh, look, it's been a minute, maybe I should change my oil. Any excuse. I hated going to work, I hated getting out of bed, I'd forced myself to complete tasks. So at the same time as I dreaded going, once I did go, I spent long, long hours by myself beating my head against the problems over and over and over and over again. And I began job hunting. And we're not talking like switching from one company to another. I'm talking maybe I should be a janitor. Maybe I'm not cut out for this. And it was really at that point where even my husband started saying, you know, there's something seriously wrong beyond just not wanting to go to work. A job change isn't going to fix this. You need to talk to someone. And I did. And it turns out that what I always thought was laziness was ADHD. And what I thought was the level of stress that everyone deals with every day was actually anxiety on a pretty high level. And for the most part, hypothetically speaking, the average person sits at around like a two, maybe a three on the one to 10 scale of how much anxiety do you have on a regular basis, right? Which means that if a level three traumatic event happens, it bumps you up to like a five or a six. You're only about halfway to your 10. But I was sitting at like a seven, maybe a six on a good day. A level three took me to a nine to a 10, the end of the world. I could barely function. And I made a lot of mistakes, and we'll go over that in a minute. But sometimes what you think is imposter syndrome is actually something else, or at least our symptoms leading to it. So don't disregard your feelings. Your feelings are extremely important. What you're feeling is absolutely valid, and sometimes you can't handle it on your own. So in our story, our uh, wingman, Angular, takes a last-ditch effort, and he goes and takes the brain boost. And this brain boost is like usually fatal. We mere humans aren't capable of handling that much brain power and that much flood of information. And as he's dying, he gives us a small bit of information. The ancients left tech because of the monsters from the id. WTF does that mean? Like, seriously? So, Dr. PHP, what is the id? The id is a very old term for the subconscious, like an 18th century term, 18th, 19th, like Freudian, pre-Freudian. The id was the subconscious. And so we're talking about monsters from the subconscious here, imposter syndrome from the subconscious. And Dr. PHP has already taken this brain boost. He's been playing with these machines, playing with this program. So who is he for real? He's me. He's my pride. I was embarrassed to ask questions. I was embarrassed to look stupid. I was afraid to take a break. I was afraid to go home and sleep. You know those times where you go home you do absolutely nothing but stare at a wall for a couple hours. You go to bed, you wake up, and you solve the problem in 10 minutes. I would never do that. And it turned out that imposter syndrome for me was less an external force and more of an internal one. 
It was what I was causing myself. So burnout's coming, our monster, the true name of our monster. And the only way to prevent this burnout at this point is to sacrifice our pride. We have to start listening to ourselves. We do not give the beast the power to destroy us. Because this monster's name is not actually imposter syndrome, it's burnout. Imposter syndrome is a symptom. It's a tool. So think about your other feelings. Happy, sad, anger, loss, giggles. We're so happy to say the happy, good feelings are great, and we should always have them. And the negative feelings are bad. But they're not bad. Anger, jealousy, frustration, exhaustion. We use them as tools. We know that when we feel these things, we're supposed to be using them as a way to incite change. This sucks. I'm not going to stay here anymore and deal with this. I'm going to change the situation. I'm going to go home. I'm going to stop being that person's friend. I'm going to stop letting people walk all over me. Whatever the situation. We use those feelings on a daily basis as tools. But for imposter syndrome, we as an entire tech industry has decided that it just is. But it's not. Just like those other feelings, it's meant to tell you something. It's meant to be a warning. So the questions I ask myself when I start to feel imposter syndrome is I really start with the one of why right now? Why not two hours ago? Why not next week? Why right now? Why am I feeling this level of I don't belong, I'm afraid to let people know, I'm ashamed, I'm scared. Why right now? Is it because you're in a room full of people that are having conversations and you don't know the topic very well? Is it because you've been beating your head against this problem for far too long? Is it because you haven't eaten in six hours? When was the last time you slept all night? Is this an abusive job? So what would make me feel less like an imposter right now? Do I need to go take a break? Do I need to take a walk? Do I need to go eat lunch? Do I need to take a nap? I have napped at work, people. You can do it. Do you need to look for a different job? Do you need to take a two-week vacation? You know, when I ask these questions, because this next question usually pulls me up by my shoestrings. Is that an actionable answer? Because my default to what would make me feel less like an imposter right now is something really sarcastic like, well, if I just knew everything, or if I just spent last year studying this other thing instead of the thing that I liked, or if I spent more time after hours burying myself in code and learning materials instead of knitting, I would know more. That's not actionable. I mean, that's unrealistic even. Because we do have to step away and take a break sometimes. And then the last question is, can I act on that now or can I schedule it? Sometimes the question is, Maybe I do need more training. Maybe I do need more education. Can I get that from a conference that I can attend? Let me look. Let me schedule some time for some training. Let me put some time on the calendar with my principal. Or maybe I need to have a meeting with my boss and have a conversation about how I'm feeling. Maybe I needed some time off. But I can't do that right now because we're really close to the end of a deadline. But maybe in two weeks I can. So even if you can't action on it right at this very moment, make a plan. 
Put it on your calendar. And the other thing about this, the flip side of this, is you don't have to know everything. Sometimes the answer is to make connections with people that know things that you don't. Not so that you can learn it, but so that they're your resource. Because you can't keep everything in your brain. I mean, we saw that earlier in the story, people died. So make connections, make friends, work with people, find out who knows more than you, and don't feel jealous or angry or depressed that you don't know it too. Be grateful that you have someone that you can go to that knows that so you don't have to, so that you can focus on the things that you really are interested in. So when you feel imposter syndrome, you know what to do. Start asking yourself these questions. Find yourself an actionable answer. Allow that feeling to incite change. Because when you're feeling that, something's got to give. And if it's you, you'll burn out. The end.